So hello everyone, uh, welcome to the fifth edition of Dealing with Brexit Open Conversation. Um, before I start, just a little reminder that captions uh, are available uh, if you need them. Um, my name is Letizia Borto, I'm a project manager at Extracts, uh, a Manchester-based development organisation for outdoor arts. I am a white woman in my late 20s, I've got a uh, long brown hair and I'm wearing a green jumper today. My preferred pronouns are she, her. Um, just a little reminder that these sessions are meant to be an informal space uh, for information sharing uh, between peers around how to continue to impose Brexit. And this series of events is supported by Arts Council England, and it's part of Extract's ongoing work to provide resources and information to elder arts professionals uh, to keep working internationally. So in today's session, we'll have a bit of a focus on Spain. Uh, we'll look at the specificity of touring to Spain and what the rest and lifting of the visa restrictions to go to Spain uh, what it means for UK artists. So we're very happy to be joined by Hannah Madalska Geyer, who is Head of Policy and Communications at the Association of British Orchestras. So before I pass on to her, uh, let me just tell you a bit more about how the session is going to work. Uh, so we first start to hear uh, by hearing from Hannah, who will tell us a bit uh, about the experience of ABO members of touring to Spain since Brexit. And uh, she'll also share a bit about the, the work that the ABO is doing to secure um, was doing, sorry, to secure the Spanish uh, visa waiver for performing arts professional. So this is uh, to, meant to kick off the conversation and then we have a bit more time all together uh, to just discuss um, whatever you want to discuss, the challenges you might be facing and to answer any questions you might have related to Spain or not. So just a reminder that this is all uh, very informal and none of this uh, is, is meant to be legal advice. Um, but you're welcome to just ask any question uh, either in the chat or come in uh, in the conversation. And I'll pass on to Hannah now. Great, thank you, Leticia. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, I'm a white 40 something year old woman, uh, pronouns are she, her. Um, I have highlighted brown hair. Um, I'm wearing a white sweater and some gold dangly earrings um, in my home office. Um, thank you very much for having me today. So I've been asked to speak about uh, my experience of dealing with Brexit. Um, so I'll talk about what the ABO is, um, my role within the organization, uh, and what it's been like for our members uh, to tour to Spain post Brexit and the recent changes in the regulations there. So I appreciate many of you, maybe independent artists or working with independent artists. Um, I'm speaking from the perspective of touring orchestras, um, so larger groups, but also um, the experience of, of their uh, touring musicians and the freelancers that they, that they engage. Um, so hopefully um, that perspective will still be helpful to you. Um, I actually happen to also personally be based in Spain. I, I live in the Canary Islands, so um, I uh, don't have touring experience of Spain, but I do have experience of Spanish uh, bureaucracy, as some of you on this call also might have by the sounds of it. Um, so the Association of British Orchestras, the ABO, um, we're a membership organization, uh, and we essentially represent the collective interests of professional orchestras, youth ensembles, and the wider classical music industry throughout the UK. We have 68 full members, um, and they range from well-known symphony orchestras from across the UK, um, such as the London Symphony Orchestra, um, through to smaller chamber orchestras, uh, such as Academy of St. Martin's in the Fields, um, orchestras of opera and ballet companies, um, and we have a workforce of about just over 2,000 employed musicians, uh, over 2,000 administrative staff and technical crew, um, and our orchestras create about 12,000 engagements for freelance musicians uh, per year as well. Um, and essentially what we do is we um, support our members. We seek to create an innovative, collaborative, sustainable orchestral sector. We provide advice, uh, intelligence and information to, to those who work within the classical music industry. And we also connect our members with the wider music industry and wider cultural networks 
um, and music education bodies here in the UK and internationally. Um, and we've been doing an extensive amount of work um, to support our members as they resume touring post Brexit and actually um, where the orchestral sector is a little bit different to other parts of the music industry and live performances that actually whilst many have not been touring, our members have um, been touring to a certain degree. So we've we've been able to learn from their experience. Um, and that's what I'll, I'll share with you today. My In my role, I focus on predominantly on policy work and political advocacy. So I'm focusing on trying to resolve issues around mobility, both of people and of trucks, um, uh, uh, carrying musical instruments and equipment, both into the UK and out of the UK, um, as well as issues around customs um, and border controls, around carnets um, and uh, musical instruments that contain uh, um, protected species. Um, but today I'll, I'll, I'll focus on the movement of people and uh, touring artists. What I do day to day and why I suppose I can speak to you about this today um, is I, I answer our member orchestra's questions about touring to the EU. I gather case studies about their experience experiences and the issues that they're coming up against. Um, and a large part of my job is raising these issues with politicians and with government to raise awareness of the issues that our sector is facing and try to propose solutions um, to enable tourists, uh, artists to tour more easily. Um, so the reason I think I was approached by Extracts is because um, we recently gathered a number of very detailed accounts of our members who were touring to Spain since Brexit. Um, and this was before the change in the regulations. Um, and the ABO, and particularly our chief executive, Mark Pemberton, uh, played a very key role in helping to secure the Spanish visa waiver for performing arts professionals um, that, that was secured in November last year. Um, so, of course, we don't know, you know, this is the big disclaimer, we don't know the full effects of Brexit on international touring, um, given that uh, COVID has so severely impacted um, and limited travel um for the past two years um and and we know that um touring artists have had the double whammy of both covid and brexit regulations to contend with um but as i say whilst many in life performance haven't been touring uh, many members of our members have been um two countries such as spain but also germany and france and more widely outside of the eu um and what we know from those experiences, and, and we didn't need uh, members to tour to know this, is that Brexit has made multi-country touring significantly more complicated and expensive. Um, we know that the UK and the EU did not reach agreement on a visa waiver for performers when they were negotiating the trade and cooperation agreement. Um, so the EU now treats UK performers and crew as visa nationals when they're entering the EU to do paid work. And when we raise this with government, uh, they tell us that um, government wants musicians and performers to be able to tour abroad easily. Um, they say that they're making progress with many countries and ensuring that um, the EU member states match the welcoming access that the UK provides to performers coming into the UK. Um, they say that arrangements are much more straightforward than is being reported, um, that 21 member states offer visa and work permit free routes for creative performers, um, including some of the biggest markets, uh, France, Germany, and the Netherlands. Um, we feel this is somewhat misleading. The reality is that the conditions for entry vary uh, for each member state with different time limits for days spent working in each country. So from Austria's four weeks per year to Sweden's 14 days per year, for example. Um, and the, the different paperwork and registration that's required. So from Spain's NIE fiscal number application, which must be done in person in Spain, 
to Croatia's registration certificate that's required to perform contracted work. So just some examples, and I'll talk about the Spanish number in a moment. Um, and of course, we have this added challenge of the 90 and 100 and day Schengen rule for third country nationals, um, which adds a further limitation to how much time UK artists are able to spend in EU countries for um, work, visa and permit free. Um, so as well as urging the UK government to come to an agreement with the EU and with EU member states on removing the requirement for visas and work permits, um, one important thing that we've been working with government to provide is actually accurate guidance on, uh, on, on the rules on touring to the EU 27. So there is information on gov.uk um, to make sure that the sector has clarity about the rules, but our experience has been um, widely across the cultural sector that the onus thus far has been largely placed on the sector to produce and update its own guidance for touring artists. And I'm sure you, you will have seen the excellent guidance that extracts have produced um, and that many across the sector are, are working on. Um, so we feel that government backed guidance um, would really help address a lot of confusion and the lack of clarity um, around the arrangements for touring artists in the EU member states as well as alleviate pressure from uh, an already severely stretched sector, which is having to invest significant amounts of time and resource into producing the guidance ourselves. Um, but as well as looking to government to try to solve these issues, we do a huge amount of work ourselves, engaging with cultural bodies in the EU and in Brussels um, to try to find solutions. And actually um, these efforts did play a part in securing the, the visa waiver in Spain. Um, and as we know, Spain is one of the biggest markets for UK live performance, um, but it had one of the most onerous visa and work permit processes in the EU uh, prior to November. Um, so just to give you a comparison of, of how it's shifted, um, following Brexit, um, British citizens were previously subject to Spain's general immigration regime and needed a visa to um, engage in professional and artistic activities in Spain, even if these were carried out within a period of less than 90 days. So um, this included, uh, in our case, musicians going to perform in front of an audience or uh, to record a performance in Spain. Um, they needed a visa to do this and could only spend a maximum of five continuous days of performance or 20 days in a six month period. Don't write any of this down because this no longer applies, but I'm just trying to give you a taste of um, how this has changed. Um, and the case we were making is that this is disproportionate if you compare this to the UK system, which allows Spanish or other um, European performers to come and work in the UK without a visa and for no cost for up to 30 days. Um, and they can also come in for up to 90 days without a visa if they're working for a registered sponsor. Um, so, so there was a real imbalance there in terms of um, access to these markets. Um, the Spanish visa system proved to be extremely challenging for our members um, and UK touring artists. Um, it resulted in significant amounts of time and resource spent to apply for uh, work visas, uh, which ultimately resulted in loss of income because artists were unable to work during that time. Um, uh, so for example, um, our members who were touring there just last summer, they were reporting issues around um, requirements for applicants for work visas to apply in person at the Spanish embassy or visa center and to give up their passport, which obviously uh, meant that they were unable to tour anywhere else and work. Um, the documents that they required were many. Uh, the process of obtaining them, uh, extremely arduous, both for the artists and the administrative staff. Um, and the accumulated cost per visa started at about 200 pounds per person. So for a company, for example, tour of 54 
staff and musicians, this was an over 11,000 pounds of added cost. Um, the system didn't cater for self-employed musicians. Uh, many of our musicians were, were many of our artists were uh, telling us that they found the process incredibly stressful, um, that the amount of financial information was it, that was required was extremely invasive. Um, they were having to spend several hours of work to collate and print supporting documents, uh, to travel to the appointment and the bank. Um, and so many of them as a result um, told us and were quite vocal on social media about the fact that they would not want to work in Spain again if visas uh, continue to be required. And um, some of our touring organizations were seriously canceling, considering canceling future engagements in Spain um, if visas were, were going to be continued to be required. But the good news is um, that in mid-November last year, Spain waived the requirement for obtaining visas for artists touring to Spain for short-term engagements. Um, so the ABO worked alongside other cultural sector bodies, um, including, for example, the Live Group, um, as well as with uh, collaboration with UK government. And we worked through political and diplomatic channels, as well as um, with our Spanish counterparts. Um, to place sustained pressure on Spanish authorities to change the restrictive regulations. Um, so it was incredibly welcome news. It was a real boost to uh, touring artists um, in facilitating a, a, an access to a key market post-Brexit. So the new guidance uh, applies to all third country nationals. So that includes UK nationals. Um, carrying out artistic activity performed before the public or recording of any type to be distributed via mass media within a period of uh, less than 90 days. Um, so this includes artists as well as technicians um, and any professionals taking part in those activities. There are some requirements um, for those uh, uh, touring artists. Um, that include being able to um, uh, demonstrate, uh, if required, the professional relationship with the promoter in Spain, um, travel medical insurance that covers the entire period of stay, proof of sufficient financial resources, such as an employment contract or that uh, professional relationship with, with the promoter can prove that as well, um, and A1 social security certificates which is all quite standard. Um, the one issue that has cropped up rather unexpectedly is that the Spanish government included a requirement in the new regulations that each individual must, on arrival in Spain, apply in person at a local police station for a, a foreign identification number, or in, in Spain, it's referred to as an NIE number. Um, and this is essentially like a, a fiscal number that's attributed to any individual. Um, it's, it's nothing new in terms of the Spanish system itself. It's new as part of these regulations for third country nationals um, on short term visits. Um, it's, an, it's something you apply for once and it's a number that stays with you for life, but you essentially need it to sort of do anything really in Spain. Um, it, it's kind of... Um, it's just a purely administrative requirement. Um, but you do need supporting documentation. You do need to do it in person. It needs to be done in, Spain, in Spanish in Spain. Um, and this applies to all third country nationals. And this raised alarm bells for us because um, particularly in our case for orchestras, this is completely unmanageable um, for 100 musicians and crew to get processed by the police in time between landing, rehearsing, performing, um, when the orchestra may be in Spain for as little as one day. Um, and really the issue isn't so much the requirement for the number, it's the application process. So um, the wording of the current regulations and the advice from the Spanish consulate, um, who we've asked about this several times um, to clarify, um, is very clear that the NIE must be applied for by foreigners upon entry into Spain. 
Um, so we are working now to get clarification on this. Um, again, working through UK government, the Spanish consulate, and our partners in Spain. Um, ideally, the requirement would be removed altogether. However, that's unlikely. Um, so at a minimum, what we're asking for is that the application for the NIE can be made via a Spanish consulate in the UK, um, which per the consulate's own website is actually possible in other circumstances, um, rather than having to do it in person upon arrival in Spain. Um, for some reason, this isn't this hasn't been applied to short term touring artists. Uh, and, and we're not sure why. So this is what we're um, trying to find out now. Um, we have had members tour to Spain as recently as this month. Um, and I, I actually saw one of our member orchestras perform here in the Canaries uh, two weeks ago. Um, the reality of how they're dealing with it is that they're not managing to apply for this number. Um, it's not helped by the fact that promoters in Spain are telling our members that they don't need the NIE um, and that this will be covered by the A1 social security certificates, which is not, not correct. Um, so I would say anecdotally, some are taking an approach that, well, if we don't have it, no one will check and we're being told we don't need it and, and that's the promoter's responsibility. Um, we, as a, as a membership organization, when we're asked by members, obviously uh, are obliged to follow the letter of the law and give advice as it is in the regulations, which is that you do need this NIE number and it must be applied for in person in Spain. So that's where we are at the moment and how artists and organizations are choosing to apply it is, is perhaps another matter um, because of the reality of, of the complications it, it uh, brings up. Um, so we're continuing to work through that. Um, the good news is, and what the sector is celebrating, is that access to Spain is now much easier. And this is why I wanted to paint the rather bleak picture earlier of the previous regulations. Um, so this is good news. And this NIE requirement um, is not a major obstacle. But if, if we were to follow the rules as they're set out, it, it's impossible to get the NIE. Um, and therefore, it's impossible to be in line with the regulations. So um, it's good news. We don't want to. Um, uh, you know, we want to celebrate it. We don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot by raising something that, you know, could jeopardize the arrangement. But equally, um, this is a technicality that does need to be um, clarified. Um, so we continue to work through that. And we're also continuing to uh, also try to seek a relaxation of entry rules um, into the states that are still, uh, that still have some question marks over them. So uh, Croatia, Greece, Portugal, Bulgaria, Malta, Cyprus, these are still countries that um, we're trying to get to grips with um, and get clarification on. So I'll stop there. Hopefully that gives you um, some insight, but I'm happy to answer whatever questions I can. Thank you so much. That's been really, really helpful. I'm sure everyone learned a lot uh, there. Um, so does anyone maybe have any question around touring to Spain? Ivan, your hand is up. Oh, uh, no, I was just applauding. Was oh, just, sorry. That's, just <laughs> that's not a hand. That's, um, that's really useful. Um, thank you. Thank you. And yeah, your hand is up. Just a quick question. Um, the the touring period. Can you can you repeat that one more time? Is it how many days within the how many days period? Sure. So. So um, generally, so within Schengen, it's 90 days within 180. Um, and most of the EU 27 states apply that. Most are permit free with that time period. But then again, as I say, each member state does vary um, from country to country, but generally it fits within that 90 day rule. Um, and of course the 90 day rule is, is challenging in itself because obviously if you're a touring artist who say, you like to spend lots of time holidaying in the south of France and then you come back and then you need to go back for work all of that counts towards towards your 90 days so this is something that we're also working with our uh, partners in um, Brussels on uh, trying to uh, ease or find exemptions too 
Thank you. Any other questions around touring to Spain? Yes, Anya. Go Sorry, actually, one, one follow up question that only applies, of course, to UK nationals, right? So if in the company there is lots of European nationals, as in German, Spain, Spanish or whatever, that wouldn't apply to them at all. Uh, yeah, it applies to third country nationals um, within Schengen as European citizens. There's obviously free movement, um, but it, it does apply differently for paid work. Uh, so that is where you do need to make sure that, you know, and I put the disclaimer on all of this is that you must check, obviously, with whatever your um, whatever country you're touring to, um, even for European citizens to make sure that that you have the right, you know, registration certificates or whatever it is that apply for paid work. It's different, obviously, if you're just traveling um, as a tourist, but for undertaking paid work, then, you know, you, you do need to check the rules that apply. But yes, it, this is largely for UK nationals. And that's that's based on the individuals. It's not based on the company being registered in England, for example. No, where the company being registered in England will um, affect things is obviously things like social security com contributions. Um, you know, if if they're employed um, on PAYE, paying national you know, insurance and tax here in the UK, how that's offset uh, with with social security contributions in in the eu um so uh again each country will have their own requirements most require a1 certificates which are social security contribution certificates um uh so yeah that, that in terms of where the company is registered that's that's really what you'll want to check thank you hannah i think liz you've got your hand up Thanks. Um, so have you ever come across um, um, something that's a, an alternative to an A1? The um, uh, reason I'm asking is um, we recently needed an A1 for working in Switzerland. Uh, we're both dual national. Um, I got one, but because Daniel's originally Swiss, we think he was given a, a, a different certificate, which is not an A1, but they said, well, it does the same. So uh, does Hannah have any experience of people applying for A1s but not being um, uh, getting an A1 and um, and then that being okay or not okay? Um, so A1s are a real pain, <laughs> um, as you know. Um, I don't have a short answer for you. What I would say is that, again, the A1 requirement varies from country to country. Some countries are extremely insistent on it and won't pay their performers until they're presented with a physical A1 certificate. Others are a little bit more lenient. Um, uh, I don't know an alternative to the A1. Um, I don't know the answer to that, whether there's an alternative or not. What I do know is that um, the 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 norm is is the requirement for the A1 certificates within the EU. Switzerland not being part of the EU, perhaps there's a different uh, arrangement there, um, as there would be with Norway or um, Iceland, Liechtenstein, and other countries. But um, with the EU, uh, you would normally be required to present the A1, particularly in Southern European countries. So France and Spain, for example, in particular, are very um, um quite strict about that requirement but of course there's i do know that um there are often delays in getting the a1 certificates through hmrc um and that's and, and that's a that's a real frustration and one of the things that we have been speaking to government officials about is whether there's any way to digitize the process um so far uh there is not much progress on that <laughs> thank you as Jay, you've got a question? Yeah, I was just wondering, you mentioned um, needing supporting documents to get the NIE registration in Spain, but I didn't know what those supporting documents might be. Okay, so um, there is a um, an application form that has to be filled out. Um, which you get from the Spanish consulate uh, website. They have links that will take you yeah. to the various um, requirements. But the supporting documents can be, it depends a bit on your situation, but it can be um, a, a work contract, um, something that demonstrates that you have enough uh, funds in your bank account to sustain yourself when you're in the country. 
Um, sometimes they'll require the, to see the medical insurance cover. Um, they, they, um, it, 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 there are standard documents, but it can kind of depend on the mood of the day <laughs> of the officer that you're seeing. And this is part of the reason why we're working so hard to remove this requirement to do this in person in Spain, because it will vary region to region. It will vary depending on the officer you get. Um, so, uh, you know, but generally it will be proof of um, proof of work, proof of financial funds, proof of health insurance. Yes, I am unfortunately familiar with the um, vagaries of Spanish bureaucracy. Yeah. And of course, this all has to be also done in Spanish. Um, uh, yeah, and costs about 12 euros. Marce, did you have a question? Um, no, it was more to do with, um, with, with companies instead of individuals. So um, yeah, that would apply probably to this. So thank you. Great. Yes, Victoria. Hi. Um, so we tend to, when we're doing our outdoor um, touring, we tend to travel with a driver. Do you know if they would qualify for the visa exemption or whether we'd need a, to get one of our technicians to be driving? Um, well, the, the uh, visa waiver applies to crew. Uh, so anyone who's involved. It's a good question about whether the driver <laughs> um, qualifies. Um, I think if they're associated with the production, then yes, but uh, I would have to triple check. Um, I think that, you know, it, it's also whether the driver is staying with you through the duration, um, because obviously, of course, there are different rules that apply to, um, to uh, transport and vans and trucks uh, now, because now we're, we're under new road haulage rules under the TCA, um, so cabotage rules um, and limits. So I don't know if you're traveling with your own van or if you were um, going with uh, an events hall year, but all of that, all of that plays a part in it. Yeah, we, um, we have our own vans, so we'll be traveling with that. So I also have many questions about cabotage. I don't know if it's the time to raise that or whether the... Um, I'm, I'm happy to... Yeah. <laughs> um, so cabotage is one of those things I've had explained to me many times and does just keep, um, keep my head. So any summary that you could give would be fantastic. Yes. Um, so cabotage is, um, yes, also gives me sleepless nights and headaches. Um, so essentially uh, pre-Brexit, um, UK hauliers were able to um, take their trucks across Europe um, uh, without restriction. Now, since uh, Brexit, um, we are now subject to new road haulage limits. So in your case, Victoria, with your own van, you, I suspect you're operating on what's called own account, um, which means that you would normally have had a cultural exemption uh, in Europe to be able to take your equipment and your sets um, as you needed across Europe. Um, but you don't have that exemption within the TCA, unfortunately. So that means that um, you are subject to those cabotage rules. So essentially cabotage is the movement of goods between two places within one country. Um, you then have what's called cross trade, which is from country to another country. Um, and you have bilateral movements, which are from the UK into the EU and back. And there are limitations on each of those things. So. Um, now, under the new TCA rules, um, you can only do two stops or two unloads of your set um, after your initial journey into the EU. Um, and only one of those can be cabotage, and it has to be done within seven days. So it's extremely limiting. Um, the, <laughs> the, the, the road haulage limits are, are really one of the most limiting um, elements post-Brexit. Um, so we're trying to get cultural exemptions for event hauliers um, and particularly for own account operators. Um, but as this is something that's agreed at EU level, it, it's very, this is something that's very difficult to change because the UK government's not keen on re-entering into negotiations with the EU on this. Um, so I don't know if that, that's, a, that's the synopsis, Victoria, but I'm happy to, you know, if you have 
I'm sure you have more questions. We, I'm happy to help if I can separately. Thank you, Hannah. Merci. Yes, uh, actually, I'm going to ask it. I, I don't know if it's um, uh, if you can help me. Um, it's, it's more to do with the invoicing side side of it. So we are not we are a small company and we are not that registered. Uh, anytime that we had to invoice, we we applied for this ROIN number, but then organizations back in Spain, they don't have the same numbers and systems. So literally our number kind of doesn't fit their forms because they are quite rigid. So sometimes it's like it's an app and because we are we are both Spanish, who um, both of the artistic directors, then we managed sometimes to do it, you know, using our near and all of that. But I don't know if there's a way <laughs> that to do that with you know if you are but if you don't pay bad um if you know i, I don't you know i don't know the answer to that question um i can certainly try to see what i can dig up but i i'm afraid i don't know the answer to that um not many of our members come to us with questions around vat okay I'm sorry. <laughs> it's sorry. It's actually because yeah, it's been, we're it's not because we're not VAT registered. We're not VAT registered. I I have this problem because I have my own production company. Little Soldier is also a, a company based in the UK. We are both registered companies, and so we have. I'm just looking at my registration certificate over there. We have a, a seven-digit red company registration numbers, and the Spanish system can only cope with eight-digit registration company registration numbers and because all companies in Spain however large have to be VAT registered it completely sends the whole system into meltdown because you cannot give them and in, you know, I mean it, I've not done it since Brexit so it used to be an intra-community uh, VAT registration it used to be compulsory to put that on any documentation um, so, but even so now it's still, you know, it still will affect it, but it's just a slightly different way that it's going to affect it. It's just the, the forms are so rigid. It's literally like you've got to put your company registration number here and they ask for things like your company seal, which of course we don't have. I'm actually buying a rubber stamp so that I can say that I've got one. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, and it's, I think people don't understand what they're being asked for when they're asked for a company seal. And think and stupid things like that, you know, because they're so rigid and they and they. I mean, surely they must understand that literally not everybody in the world has the same system as Spain. I mean, heaven forfend. But <laughs> yeah, I wish I wish I could give more insight to that question. And I suppose I would just encourage you to ask any. I suspect you work with promoters um, and partners in Spain, and perhaps that's something they can help with. And you know, if they have accountants or someone, no, they can't help. I mean, yeah. well, so far, like we've. We have so many accountants everywhere. So, you know, like um, it's the kind of question I'm always like, oh, do you know how to do this? And no one, no one knows. Like you yeah. have to kind of engineer some magic, you know. Yeah, to I, I nearly broke the Catalan government um, finance system trying to get a payment out of them a few years ago, uh, and I, I still don't think they've recovered. <laughs> I just Maybe, had a quick one. Yeah, I just on. had a quick one on cabotage, just in terms of that um, own vehicle thing, because we're very similar. We've got a vehicle, and I just wonder: is that so? Are you saying that we can only make two unloads, even if we have our own vehicle? Because I didn't think there was any restrictions on that, but I was just curious about that. Yeah, I mean, essentially, what the cabotage rules limit is how many places and times you can stop and unload your truck before having to come back to the UK. So essentially you can only make two stops within one country after you've originally arrived to your original destination. And then you have to come back to the UK or you can do one stop in one country, another stop in another country, and then you must come back into the UK. Um, it's extremely restrictive and where own account operations um, are concerned, the, the same applies. Um, there is an exemption for, in the music industry anyway, there's an exemption for splitter vans. Um, and that essentially would mean that you've got people and equipment in the same van. Um, so I get, it really applies to kind of rock and pop touring, but maybe it's something that puppets with guts can 
can apply um, uh, because they're there you, you don't you're not subject to the restrictions there's an exemption for split events but there are no other cool. no other exemptions for other trucks thank you that's really helpful thank you yeah <laughs> Lissy yeah I think this might be the same thing as the splitter van thing I was told by someone like that um but yeah if we tour in a splitter van essentially that that could be covered under the interbus agreement and so cabotage wouldn't apply um which sounds like it might be the same thing as yeah splitter vans don't have to do this cabotage business yeah splitter vans are exempt um they have an exemption from the regulations and that was that was confirmed quite recently. That was only confirmed towards the end of last year. So that's great news. Um, maybe one last question before we wrap up, please. Thanks. Um, can I just um, when you say splitter vans, that has to be a van which is constructed as one part um, uh, load and one part people because all vans are like that. You know, we're a puppet company we've got all our equipment and puppets but we're also the performers but it's not a technically a van which is designed to be split but we are performers with kit so what's the difference can we be called a splitter van no i think you need to get an actual crew bus you know the one where it's got the extra row of seats behind mm -hmm. and so long as there's a bulkhead behind you it's considered separate you have a half well we have a half bulkhead and mm -hmm. seats behind it's modified I, I can't help you there. I don't no. design buses. Sorry. And I, I, I don't understand how are they going to um, implement this? I mean, we've for 30 years, we've traveled, uh, you Isn't know, it? here, there and everywhere, um, hopping into Germany, France, Switzerland, Liechtenstein with our shows. How are we how are we going to be controlled? Um, the short answer. So on split events, I I couldn't tell, I couldn't answer the technicalities, but there, you could definitely find that out um, from, um, you know, even um, our partners like the Musicians Union, for example. So th those who operate more in that space will have a lot more detail of what exactly constitutes a splitter van and, you know, but a lot of these questions you're asking actually often we don't have a clear answer to from from officials so we're we're figuring it out as as we go as well um and that's why i say the splitter vans issue was something that was uh, only confirmed sort of towards the end of last year so um th there's a lot of confusion around a lot of it still um in terms of you know how are they going to police it the short answer is a lot of them aren't um you know and you you know you can take I would, I would certainly not advise um, to take the chance and, you know, just go anyway with your van and see what happens. Um, but certainly, you know, we have some case studies of where um, uh, touring artists have been stopped, um, others where it's been totally fine. Um, most of the time, uh, border officials, you know, don't know the rules themselves. Um, that brings a whole raft of other problems. So, you know, I would certainly advise to try to obviously follow the rules and not take the risk, but equally, um, you know, there are not cases of people being sent to prison for not following capital rules. You know, it's, I think we have to remember this is all very new. Um, everyone is getting to grips with it, including those having to enforce the rules. So, you know, and because we haven't had the volume of touring that we would normally have because of COVID, I think all of these teething problems are only starting to come out now. So the, there are things that, you know, we never expected to have to deal with that we're now all dealing with. So, um, you know, we, we can only work with the rules as far as we understand them. Can I just ask one very quick last question? The, you're talking about the exemption with, and you mentioned it's obtainable through the mu Musicians Union. So you have to be a member of the Musicians Union. Oh, no, right? no, no, no. I meant that they'll have information about, for example, what is a split van. So you don't obtain the, the exemption. It's just that split vans aren't required under the new regulations. But um, what I'm suggesting is, uh, you know, if you check the Musicians Union website, for example, um, under touring the, you know, they they have lots of information about Brexit and touring the splitter vans um, because they deal with musicians who who travel in that way more. Our members don't travel in that way, um, but you could find more information there. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a really really interesting conversation. Thank you, Hannah, so much for sharing all of your uh, knowledge uh, with us. Um, I think what will be really useful for us uh, as extracts to know is. Uh, 
amongst uh, all of the companies uh, present today, which of you have any booking uh, confirmed or penciled in Spain or any other countries uh, in Europe? So if you could just pop in the chat, uh, if, you, if you feel like you have anything to share, that'd be really useful for us to kind of keep an eye on what's happening. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, I hope we find it useful. Uh, I just wanted to finish by announcing uh, that we are looking at implementing a few more services to support UK artists uh, to tour in Europe post-Brexit. Uh, we will provide soon um, a visa and work permit service uh, in partnership with the visa specialist company. So if you have, for example, a tour with a specific project in mind, like if you have a um, a gig in Germany, but you're not quite sure uh, how the process would work to get there, if you need a visa or not, how much will it cost, uh, we can put you in touch with that visa specialist company and they can advise. We're also looking at the possibility of ATA carnet training, so if it's something you're interested in, uh, please uh, send me an email, same thing with the visa service, just drop me a line and I'll, I'll register your interest. Um, and we have another dealing with Brexit session in a couple of months in March. So if you have anything to share, uh, we can hear from people with real life experience. So uh, please do get in touch with us. So thank you again for joining today and we hope to see you very soon.